Good. Okay. Hey, um, I'm Prasant. I'm a senior engineer slash data scientist slash sometimes I don't know what I'm doing, engineer on the AI Center of Excellence at Red Hat. So uh, as you see from the slide, it's machine learning for developers and QE. So you can see from the title, like I'm going to start rambling on and on about machine learning. But why developers and QE? Why disturb the poor souls and not let them live in peace? So, so what do I mean by machine learning? Now, if you walk down the hall, not that hall, nobody's there. So if you walk down and ask someone like what machine learning is, like you'll get like n number of definitions. And God forbid, don't ask a data scientist what machine learning is. Like they'll confuse you even more. So, but here I'll refer machine learning. I'll use it as like an overarching term, like and relate that to anything related to statistics, like analytics, data, anything that you use with data and try to get like meaningful information from there. And uh, coming back to like why developers and QE, so there are like several personas out there, like users, like data scientists, like rocket scientists, the mighty Thor, and even Ant-Man. Like they all have data. What do you do with it? Like, and what do you do to like get meaningful insights into the data? So machine learning is one popular technique to do that. And it lets you get meaningful insights not into the not only into the data that you have, but also lets you foresee the data that you will have. In more technical terms, that's like the prediction. So I'm going to focus specifically on developers and QE, like explain certain use cases that's um, specific to development and uh, QE. So uh, let's see. I forgot what I practiced. Okay. But uh, so, I mean, when you talk about, I mean, when you want to learn a new language or when you're introduced to something new, you always look for a hello world example. Well, is there like a hello world example for machine learning? That's the field is too broad to ask for that. But think of this as like a hello world presentation or a, or a hello world like a uh, template where we, I'm going to show like a tool or a framework that lets you turn pre-built machine learning algorithms into a service and uh, kind of provide an easy interface for you to access these uh, machine learning models through the service and uh, play with your data. And if you want to move further and uh, uh, kind of advance the code, like uh, tailored to your own uh, use case, you could do that. And uh, and then you can uh, follow the same fashion of like how do you turn that into a service and um, make it more uh, user user friendly. So um, uh, so I'm gonna explain uh, the tool or like the framework that I'll be using for this. It's called AI Library. So it's a part of a bigger project called uh, Open Data Hub. I don't know. If, so this. Uh, open Data Hub, there was a session yesterday about Open Data Hub, so that's like a machine learning as a service platform that has all the bits and pieces, like ranging from streaming services like Kafka, like how you saw in the previous slide, I'm sorry, in the previous talk, and a uh, bunch of other tools like Jupyter Hub and um, like data, data handling services, like plenty of other stuff. So AI Library is just a part of it, and um, it has like an open source collection of uh, AI components, which ranges from like simple statistical algorithms like regression, correlation analysis, to all the way to uh, like uh, natural language processing models, and so. So, and uh, it also provides like uh, support around like uh, bringing up the infrastructure around uh, machine learning models like uh, data handling, and uh, lets you turn that into a service. So, having this environment set up now you can quickly uh, play with the algorithms without like trying to develop it from scratch and uh, kind of like lets you do rapid prototyping so let me jump into the architecture so once deployed like uh, the AI library sits on top of like uh, the container platform that's uh, we use like uh, at openshift 
and on top of it is going to be Selden. So Selden is uh, an open source platform to serve models. So anytime you have a model like a Python code or a Java code, anything that does machine learning, you want to package that into a container and kind of serve it through like a REST API or a gRPC. So Selden lets you do that. So and we kind of like wrap all this in a nice package so that it's easy for you to do it. And of course for the store uh, data handling part, like. It's compatible with any S3 um, storage, but here we've used uh, Ceph, but if you have any other S3 backend, it'll work too, like AWS or Minai or any S3 compatible ones. So the topmost uh, part is where like it shows what models are there in the library right now. So like association rule learning, correlation analysis. So I'm gonna focus on four of those because I have data sets specific to QE or development environment. So that's like association rule learning, correlation analysis, flake analysis and duplicate bug detection. detection. So those four I'm gonna explain in detail as we move on. But uh, to give you an overview of like the rest of the stuff, so let me start with fraud detection. So fraud detection was, uh, was the one that was uh, uh, showcased in the last talk. So where they uh, were streaming data through Kafka and kind of like trying to predict whether a certain transaction was fraudulent or not. Typically, this is used in a financial setup, like where you're trying to uh, detect fraud in a credit card transactions. So that's the model, and it's based on, I think, random forest regression. And sentiment analysis and uh, topic modeling, they are pretty common uh, natural NLP use cases. So sentiment analysis, you want to get, uh, kind of classify the uh, sentiment around like uh, a certain text, whether it's like positive, negative, or neutral. And uh, topic modeling is kind of like uh, a subpart of like uh, sentiment analysis, where you kind of like try to uh, condense any given uh, natural language text into like short information. So you have like a huge document, you want to just get uh, a bunch of topics that actually uh, tell like what the whole document is about. Then that's a simple use case for topic modeling or if like there are a bunch of like uh, tweets and you want to say like okay what is it being, what are they talking about and then you use like topping modeling on the whole and just get condensed information and uh, regression that's plain simple uh, linear regression or could be like multivariate or uh, simple and matrix factorization that's uh, that's a use case that's came from the DevOps team. So you, you might remember this algorithm from the Netflix price challenge where they were trying to get a recommendation system built. So that's the algorithm that's uh, underneath the hood. But in, uh, um, in our IT environment, it's being used to like uh, uh, recommend like packages for a certain uh, build environment you might have. Anomaly detection and uh, so anomaly detection is basically where you, like, you try to uh, look for anomalous records in your data. And in this case, like, it was used on uh, a build log data. So they were trying to like, find if there was any anomalous data. And it's based on uh, an unsupervised learning technique called isolation forest. So here's a typical workflow on how you would interact with the AI library. So you start with uh, deploying it. So there are like two ways to deploy it. One is it's available through the Open Data Hub operator, or if you want to like get hands-on, it's more you have the Ansible roles. We use like the Ansible playbook to uh, install it, and I'll show it in a in a bit. And once you uh, deploy this, like the models are gonna uh, show up as a service on the uh, OpenShift platform. So the model itself, they exist as Python core and a Git repo. So what does uh, the deployment do? It basically pulls down the code, like builds the container, pushes it to the Docker Hub or any repo that you have, and then tries to spin up the container on the OpenShift platform and then 
Selden also lets you uh, kind of like expose a REST interface, so any further interaction with the model happens to REST API calls. And once you have everything there, like uh, you need uh, a train model. So the train models, you basically save the train models to your backend. Now there are, there are pre-trained models which are available, but if you want to have your own model, do your own training, like use, at this moment you need to use like Jupyter Hub or like any external env environment that comes with uh, Jupyter, oh, sorry, Open Data Hub. Train the model and push it to the Ceph or like the S3 backend. And once you have the model stored, you basically start interacting with the prediction endpoint like with the, through a REST call, which, uh, so once you send the REST call, it uh, seldom forwards it to the specific model or the part that's uh, hosting the model, which in turn fetches the train, train model, does the prediction and returns you the result. So I'll uh, kind of show uh, how the deployment is done through uh, Ansible. So this is a, can you guys see the font or do you want me to increase it? Okay. So this is an OpenShift environment we have and uh, so I've pre-deployed all the models in this namespace. So the last three you see here is Selden. The last three uh, components belong to Selden. So the Selden Core Redis server, the API server, and the cluster manager. So the Redis is more for like in-memory data management. And uh, the API server is the one that uh, kind of uh, takes in your uh, REST calls and forwards it to the, the part that kind of hosts your model. And the Selden cluster manager kind of keeps a watch on all your deployments and uh, manages that. Now let me go back. So I've uh, cloned the repo and uh, I'm gonna set, try to uh, deploy one model because if I'm gonna, by default, like when you run this play, Ansible playbook, it's gonna deploy the entire set of models, like all the libraries and everything, but now I'm gonna just restrict the deployment to one specific model. So as you see, like I've just uh, turned on like the fraud detection. Now before you uh, run it, you might wanna configure like certain parameters that the model kind of access, like uh, what's the namespace that you wanna deploy it to, like what's the base image that you wanna use to build up the containers, and uh, where does the code live, and where do you wanna push the uh, built containers. And when it comes to model specific things, you just give it a name and uh, like uh, resource uh, constraints, like how much memory do you want to use, like how much CPU you want to use. And all this is available to the operator, but I'm gonna just uh, show the, the Ansible version here. And the other thing that you, you want to define is like the, S3 backend details like the endpoint, the access key, and the secret key. It's defined down. I forgot to delete it, so I'm not going to show my secret key here. Yep, now see, so because I already had the fraud detection model, it kind of cleans up and then tries to create the part that uh, hosts the uh, fraud detection model. Let's go in and see. So the parameters that you actually uh, define there, like in terms of the CPU memory, you can see like it gets reflected here. And when you go into the logs, you can see that it's ready, it's running on, and it's ready to uh, receive the request. Now if you come to the Selden part, because that's the one uh, managing the thing, so you can see that, uh, so it added the deployment for that fraud detection model, and it's uh, watching out for its request. 
similar is the case for the cluster manager. So it's going to look watch all these deployments and uh, um, manage that. So now uh, I'll just uh, briefly explain what this happens. So basically, like uh, verifies that you have everything in the configuration and uh, clones the repo, then uh, kind of builds the template to spin up the container and creates the container and then pushes it up and uh, hosts the model. Now this specific part it says like update graph details. So Selden not only allows you to like host like single models, but you can kind of like uh, host like multiple models, kind of do like A slide A B testing, like kind of like pipeline stuff there. But at this moment, like ALI only supports like hosting model as a standalone. But if you want to have your own deployment file it modified that way, it, it would definitely work. So now let me jump into the models itself. So that's specific to the development or QE environment. So let me start with correlation analysis. So what is correlation analysis? So it's it's very, in simple terms, it tries to get the relationship between uh, variables you might have. Like, say you have X and Y, it says, like, is there a possible connection between the two? Like, does one influence the other? Say, like, if one increases, does the other increase or decrease? So depending on, like, how it, which direction it goes, whether, like, if one increases the other one, like, then it means that it has a positive influence. But if it's in the other way, in the other direction, it means negative. And it also tells you the strength of the association, like whether it's strong or uh, weak. So that basically it gives you a value between 0 to 1, saying like how, how you move between 0 and 1. It tells you whether it's strong or weak. So how do you use this in a dev QE environment? So I'm going to, the data set that I use is uh, focuses specifically on the bugs reported. So in a typical uh, dev QA environment, there's like the bugs reported and the bugs that are fixed. So it's basically less like uh, think of it like an incoming uh, queue and an outgoing. So it needs to balance itself. Like the number of bugs that come in and the number of bugs that go out or get fixed, it needs to be kind of like equal so that you stay balanced and you don't build a backlog to it. This is not any made-up data, so it's from the OpenStack Neutron team, and uh, I'm gonna show like uh, the data from that team. So you basically uh, plug in the data that you showed in the tabular format, like, and then uh, try to send in the curl request. This is the one. Yep. So now what happens here is like, so you send the data to the model that's already hosted on the OpenShift platform, and it basically gives you back the result saying, okay, what, what is, what is, what, what can I say about the data? So in this case, the two data sets have like positive small correlation, and it's statistically insignificant. So, which brings back to the question, like, the OpenStack Neutron team is not keeping up with the bugs that come in. So, which definitely leads to a backlog. And the other one is, like, in, in our model, we, we don't save the plot, but we can also save the plots and uh, kind of look at it. So, so you can see, like, the red is, is where the bu incoming bugs, and it starts creeping up. and. They don't keep up with uh, fixing the bugs. So this is definitely a, a backlog that's happening, and uh, you can look at uh, through analyzing the data. Okay. 
So the next data is, is more from a QE endpoint. So like once a bug is fixed, like uh, it goes through multiple stages. Like it goes to on QA where like you ask the QE to verify if the fix really works. And then once it's uh, verified, it moves from uh, verified to released, where you actually release the fix to the customer. So that's a critical process too. Like the once the the fix hits the QE pool, it needs to be verified quickly, and also it needs to be released quickly. So in this case, we are trying to like uh, weigh the bug bug fix verified versus the released. Now, does that like tally and if they keep up in that sense? So th this gives a more insight into the QE process. Typically, like a QE manager would want to know this, like if the QE team is actually keeping up with verifying bugs, as well as like, uh, and if it's being released. So here's a query that we ran, and it came back saying the result is statistically significant, and there's a strong correlation. But if you look at the correlation, it's like 0.5. To, it's just over like 0.56. It means like it's a 50-50. It's more than a 50-50 chance that uh, they're keeping up with the process. But you can dive more deeper and see like uh, if you want to look at specific trends, then you go into like actually modeling the behavior. Like you can use regression if, if there's a strong correlation. So now let's move to the the next uh, model, that's uh, association rule learning. So this is another model that lets you f uh, find relations between uh, variables, but it does in the sense of, in the form of rules. So this is this model is widely used in like market-based analysis, like when you do like uh, shopping and do like market like, uh, grocery transactions or things like that you want to see like is there like an association of a certain item with another so an example would be like anytime people bought butter they ended up buying bread so that's like an association or a rule that was discovered within the transaction now what, what measures does it come with like there are like it's confidence support and lift but to pl explain that in uh, plain terms, confidence basically tells you, like, say in the above example, like, what are the chances of someone buying a bread given that there's butter or things like that. So you're looking at the chance of one happening given the other one. And support basically tells you, like, how frequently does this association happen. And lift is another, uh, lift is a measure that's more like, uh, in purely technical terms, it's like the conditional prob probability of uh, the, an event happening given the confidence because it's, that's already a probability. Now you're like conditioning on the knowledge that that, that thing is happening. But in simple terms, lift just tells you like, uh, what is the effect? of the, uh, the rule body, like the, in this case it's the bread, on butter. If it says like, uh, does it have like, uh, posi is it positive, negative, or there's no relevance at all? So it's like, the more you buy bread, so the more you buy butter, do you buy more bread? Or like, is it the other way around, or there's totally no um, relevance here? Now how do you tie this to a, a software development or QE environment? Let's see. Okay. So here's here's some data that I took uh, from the same OpenStack Neutron team. Does anyone work on OpenStack Neutron here? Okay, I think. Please don't sue me. Uh, SH my life runs on prepaying mortgages, so. So this is true data. So basically, you look at the developers and the QE pool, and you say, like, uh, what is the severity of the bug that they worked on? It's like urgent, high. I mean, it's just a sample data, but there's like a bunch more, like um, medium severity or low. And how much time did it take for them to fix the bug? And how much time did it take them to verify the bugs? So if you look at it, like, there is definitely an association here. Because uh, I mean, when, a, uh, when you hit a bug, it needs to be explained in a certain way that 
both the developers and the QE need to understand. And once the developer fixes it and provides the fix, he needs to give the steps to uh, reproduce it or like steps to verify it. So, and that's kind of like uh, uh, flows into like how quickly the QE can verify. So if you kind of think about it as like, you can derive like an association between the developers, QE, and the time it takes for them to uh, go through all this process. So uh, when you run this, uh, let me show you. It's So when you run this, like you're going to get a bunch of data which makes no sense, but this is separated out in columns. But once you export this to a spreadsheet and start looking at the different columns, then uh, you can start asking questions there. So as I showed in the previous uh, slide, it does come with like those metrics like confidence, frequent, like support, and lift. Basically, tells you like the chances of one happening with the other, or like how frequent they are, and things like that. So here are some of the questions that I asked, and I'm certain that I'm going to end up in trouble, but I'll still uh, present it. So, so you take a developer and kind of try to associate what is the time taken to fix bugs, right? Now you can you can look at the confidence level, saying like you have the time taken to fix bugs and you have the developers. Now you look at the different uh, time intervals, say take a week. So you can ask the question whether a developer will be able to fix an urgent severity bug in a one week's time. And let's see what the analysis came out with. So all these names, so I think this would be more useful from the management side or like uh, when you're assigning the bugs. So here, Tim Rogers has like a 100% chance of fixing that bug within a week. And so does Steve Hillman has like an 80% chance. And if any of you are on the bottom there, please erase that or like, that tells you like how confident can you be with the developer in fixing a bug within that week, within a single week. And you can start asking more questions like say if it's not an urgent severity bug but it's more like medium severity and your process uh, lets you go for like a two week interval, you, wanna, you can study that relation too. Now, so you move one step up in the management chain. You want to look at the development team as a whole and say, it's like, uh, what's the chance that, uh, how's the team doing with, level, with respect to like addressing like urgent severity bugs in a single week's time? So that is like, there are different percentages there uh, and with respect to the time intervals. And the same, you can ask for the QE teams. So. Will they be able to verify the bug fixes, or will they be able to reproduce? And there are so many ways you can ask questions. But basically, it tells you can look at the individual data, even not if like the association rules. You can also look at the individual metrics that's thrown out there and get meaningful insights. So next is the the flake analysis. So this um, came out as a came out as a use case from the Fedora cockpit team. So they're basically trying to find test flakes, test that fails but shouldn't have failed. So how do they how did we do it? So we use uh, clustering and classification. So you basically take a bunch of test logs and say like you try to group them into. Uh, clusters, like something that's, they're pretty common to each other. And you start forming these clusters. And once you have clusters, and of course, like within these clusters, you have, you would have like test cases that have failed, but where like, I mean, there were like flakes. So you would basically kind of like uh, compute the probability of a test being a flake within that group. So now you have like, uh, within a big pool of, Test logs, you have these like small logs where you can uh, narrow down your focus. Now, when you get a new test failure, you can kind of push this into a classification problem where you're taking the test log and trying to see like uh, which 
group can I go into? Or in another case, like we use the k nearest neighbors. Say like, okay, which is the nearest cluster that I can associate myself to? And once you do that, you uh, go back to the compute the probability that you computed, saying like, what's the, what is my chance of being a flake now that I belong to this group? And that basically tells you like, what's the probability of a certain um, test being a flake? Yep. So this is a sample execution. So. Uh, Okay, the data, what, what goes into the request is like uh, you uh, give the model, the pre-trained model, and then you show a sample log. So this is the whole log. And say like, uh, hey, tell me if this is a flake or not. Okay, so it came back with uh, saying like there's a 33% chance that this is a flake. Now, based on your experience, or you might want to set the threshold and uh, decide whether you want to like take, report this as a flake or not. Typically, like anything over 50 or like 75 percentage, that's, that's a good chance it's a flake. Yep, so that's the result that you saw in the demo. So next we have uh, duplicate bug detection. So uh, that's a classical case that uh, you would see in any development QE environment where like when you're submitting like a, a bug, there's chances that it might already have been submitted by someone else or it already exists in your bug database. So you might want to detect duplicates. There's plenty of techniques. And the one we have here basically uses topic modeling. So it runs through your existing pool of bugs and uh, does topic modeling in the sense like it condenses all the bugs and all the information related to each bug into much shorter information. And once a new bug comes in, it goes through the same step of like condensing its information and then running it through uh, similarity measures. It basically runs through the previous set of condensed information and says like, hey, who do I match so closely? And it basically shows you like uh, top few matches. And that's configurable. Like if you want to look at like the top five matches or the 10, you could do that. So you could, uh, and all these these flake analysis or the duplicate bug detection, you can eventually turn that into a software bot. So you kind of like doing it automatically for every request that comes in. Okay. So fi finally, you come to the conclusion here. So we, I introduced you to AI library, like uh, how do you deploy it and how do you use it. So uh, and I'll I'll show you like how. Oh, I'll show you the repo and like um, what the contents of it and uh, okay. So so what do we have in plan in future? So right now, like everything, uh, all the model serving happens to Selden. So if you want to train a model now. When I explained in the earlier slide, you have to like save the trained model to the Ceph backend. But what if you want to train a model using this uh, in a framework? So we're going to like start incorporating Argo project into it. Uh, so Argo project is uh, it, it's kind of uh, I think it's a part of the Kubeflow community, and uh, it lets you. Uh, manage workflows. So a workflow is typically nothing but like a set of uh, containers that gets executed. So we're going to use uh, Argo to handle uh, uh, training of models. And the reason being is like Selden is more of a, uh, a synchronous, because once you send in the request, it, it waits. It needs to come back immediately. So that's more suitable for like, uh, in, like real-time processing. Or really fast models, and training is typically training a model kind of takes a long time, within hours or like days or things like that. So Argo lets you submit the workflows in an asynchronous manner and then come back and get the results. So that's one thing we are looking into, and the other one is uh, right now like when I sh when I showed you the Ansible playbook, like you are kind of like deploying the models through. Uh, 
I mean, through the code that's already in there. But if you, if you want to just do the, I mean, once you submit the code to the Ceph backend, if you want to turn that into a service automatically without even like going through the ODH operator or the Ansible playbook, so model runner, it's already there in the library, but it's still in the testing phase. So once you save a model to your Ceph or an S3 backend, it kind of like uh, detects that, okay, a new model has come into this pool and let me spin up a service for it. So that does, it's being done automatically. And uh, last uh, is the dashboard or the user interface for this uh, AI library. So, you know, like I've, I've been showing you like a bunch of curl commands and it's, it's really hard to like start forming the curl commands, you know, like, but once you get a hang of it, it's easier, but still you would want a much more easier interface to interact with AI library. So we started uh, putting together like a, a dashboard. Let me see. But whatever I showed you, like you could do it through a graphical interface. And I'm gonna show a slide demo. So this is what we are kind of like started testing out with the linear regression. It basically tells what the model is about, like what's the API. Here. So this is an interesting model here. For once, like, We'll have to look into the health of uh, developers and QE as well. So just to have some fun element here. So we took data set that's from people in various professions with their height, weight, and their um, health index. And it turned out to be a simple linear regression model. So you input your height, your weight, and it basically throws you back an index between zero to five. Zero meaning like extremely weak, one is your weak, three is your normal, four, you need help, and five, oh God, you need help right now. So, so that's it, and uh, so let's try here. There, it, it came back with a 2.2 minutes. It's between the normal range, so. Huh? Does anyone want to try here at live? <laughs> I pretty much pissed off my other colleagues saying, sending this to them. They don't like me anymore, so. That's. <laughs> Said 250. Yeah. Zach is still my friend, so okay, not bad. Yeah, four, good. So that's the UI, and that's a simple model to play. But uh, we're going to start putting in all the other models that uh, we showed. Let's see. Yeah, that's a thank you slide. So I'm done. So any questions? No questions from the OpenStack Neutron team. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Good presentation. Uh, I just had a question about so. So all the model serving is going to happen through Selden. Yeah. Um, what if I have a machine learning service that doesn't have a UI or doesn't have something that, you know, um, something like a backend thing, like a function? Uh, do you guys have plans to have something like a function so, as a service type of thing? So when you say it doesn't have a backend or a function, like is it? No, no UI. It just runs... Um, as a as a back back office job runs at a particular interval um, and there's no serving it'll it'll run its predictions and it'll store its predictions in um, in a data store so yeah I mean it's it's up to you to like so the model behavior is is something that's decided by you so what we show here is like you send so you have the model in your backend 
you send the data that you want to run prediction on, and it'll send you back the results. But if you want to want to alter the behavior, well, no, I, I don't want to send it through the REST API back, but I just want to like uh, store it in some backend. That, that's certainly possible too. So all Sheldon just submits the request and sends back the result, whatever the model sends it back to Sheldon. If you're not going to send anything, then it's just uh, send back a null string. But on the other hand, like your results are going to go to a back end or where you want to store it. So I think in that case, uh, how you kind of like uh, kind of monitor that? Maybe like you, you want to put that into an Argo f workflow where you can get the logs within that container and say like, hey, what happened to my workflow? And I want to see that. So pro probably you want to push move that into like an async request rather than a synchronous request. Yeah. So this, uh, the synchronous, uh, when you're in interacting with the cell then, it, you can tie that to like really fast predictions, like when you're doing it on the fly. Like in, in case of like the previous talks, they had like data streaming in through Kafka and they wanted to run prediction instantaneously. So in that case, you can like hit the Selden rest endpoint and get back the result. But in some cases, like you want to run the analysis like on a weekly basis, you don't care coming back immediately, you just run like uh, on a daily job or things like that. That's possible to do too. Thank you. It's a great talk. Um, a quick I'll question. I'll give you a beer for that. Sorry? I'll give you a beer. Oh, <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, so, uh, like, we discussed four models, like, yeah. I think. Uh, those already uh, trained models, that's what you send the prediction on? or That's the thing I missed the part. So, so linear regression, so, like, correlation analysis and association rule learning, they are kind of, like, doing... They're not model sausage, but they're like doing analysis live on that data. But flake analysis more is a pre-trained model. So something that was trained on your data set and it was stored in the Ceph backend. I didn't show the training part because training takes a little while. But when you're moving into more complex space like clustering classification or like, like neural networks, you want to store the model ahead of time. And typically, like how the process goes is like you get a bunch of data. Let's say like you stop like a week on a week timeline, train the model, and try to run the prediction for a week and see if it performs better, and then start retraining on a plus one week timeline. So the retraining part is something that would be handled as part of the Argo inclusion that's mm -hmm. going to come up. Okay. Thank you. Oh. If you start with a great talk, I'll give uh, you a cake. Yeah, sure. Thank you, uh, thank you Mr. Ambaligan, for your uh, presentation. Yeah. I appreciate that. <laughs> and uh, so, look, I mean, thinking back, so the, what we have done so far is the evaluation of developers and QE using machine learning techniques. Mm -hmm. That's what I understood. And the data scientist, I think he or she falls under both the categories, a developer as well as a, a QE person, right? Or no. In, in terms of QE, what do they do with the model part? So here, uh, let me rephrase the question. So you're asking, like, uh, how is it relevant to the QE space versus the development space? as against how a typical data scientist would do, or is, it, is that, am I right, or? So what is the role of QE in the data science? Okay. Um, so, uh, as I said, like, I mean, so traditionally, like, it all started with data scientist as a role being associated with anyone who, want, who, had, who wanted to do analysis on the data, but, We've moved away from that point and transitioned so much, like with so much tools, techniques available. Like now, like everyone has data, like you have data and I have data. So we can start using the tools and start doing the analysis. You don't have to like develop like all the algorithms from scratch, but as long as you understand like what the model throws back at you, like in terms of the metrics or what is the result. And then like the, the differentiation starts to disappear, you know. 
So in this case, like QEs, devs, or like anyone else, like they can just start using machine learning algorithms and tools rather than like trying to develop them. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.